from the uh, number of people that are assembled here, it's clear to me that I am not as well known as our speaker today. So I must introduce myself first. My name is Nara Simon, and with the help of some wonderful colleagues here, we have been able to pull this off. It's a, such a pleasant thing to have a colloquium. It is just convened for our own pleasure and education and see that it is thriving reasonably well. Um, before I invite Professor Condal to introduce our speaker, I just wanted to let you know that our speakers for the fall 2004 semester, four of the speakers have already been finalized. We'll have a speaker to talk about the coastal waters of California, a topic that we have not covered so far. Somebody to talk about earthquakes and water in California. Then a historian, a very well-known historian, Donald Pisani, will talk about, I think, the Bureau of Reclamation. And finally, we'll have a lawyer who wrote a very well-known book about water follies. He'll be here in December. So please watch out for the email announcement as well as for the brochures. And uh, so we'll be having a very good session next semester. With that, it is my pleasure to, uh, to invite Professor Matt Condolf to introduce our speaker today. Matt. Thanks, Nari. And um, thanks uh, to Nari for um, originating the idea of this series and keeping it going, and to the uh, staff of the Water Resources Archives, uh, Linda Vida, Nancy Nowitzki, and Paul Atwood for uh, keeping it going. Today it's a pleasure to introduce Gray Brecken, uh, an integral member of Berkeley's intellectual community, a uh, lifelong environmentalist. Gray uh, got all his degrees from Berkeley, a bachelor's in uh, geography and history, a master's in art history, and a PhD in geography. He's a journalist and television producer, author of Farewell Promised Land, Waking from the California Dream, and um, a book that uh, probably a number of you have seen or read, Imperial San Francisco, which I'd like to give a plug to since I think it's one of the best books I've ever read uh, on many levels. Um, Urban Power, Earthly Ruin. And this was basically um, a, uh, uh, presumably a livened up version of uh, his PhD thesis without all the footnotes. Um, today's uh, title is um, another one of those boring academic sort of titles, Rotten Foundations, and we're eager to hear all about the Bureau of Reclamation. Great, thanks so much for coming. Okay, let's, let's just start with the first slide. I'm a visual kind of guy, so um, I can't talk without slides. And can we get the lights down? I wish I could. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So, and then which one is it? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that I study is the hidden structures of dynastic power and how that affects the land and how it affects us to this day, although most people are completely unaware of it, partly because they're not allowed to know about it and partly because, um, let's see, I'm going to need a light up here, actually. Um, we, don't, we don't know about these structures largely because we're not allowed to know, but also because people really don't want to know, because it runs so counter to the, all the mythology of a democracy, and particularly of the rugged individualist, for example, um, the rugged entrepreneur. Um, in fact, the greatest fortunes to be made, as you'll find out tonight, are those to be made by getting access to the federal treasury and using the collective energies of the government to your own ends. Um, 
And so that's what part of what tonight's going to be about. Now, what I want to do is I want to set the kind of dynastic stage, the context, for the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, so this is going to seem, for the first part of the lecture, somewhat like a shaggy dog story, but it does actually have a punchline. But first, I have to set the, the, uh, the uh, stage for that. OK, I'll just need it at the beginning. OK, so th then we can turn it down. OK? So I want to start, actually. Um, I wrote an essay about, oh, 12 years or so ago for the um, San, San Francisco Examiner Sunday Magazine, which then, when they got it, they decided they weren't going to publish. Um, and so subsequently, it was actually published in a book called Reclaiming San Francisco. Um, it's about our need for tycoons. Um, and so I'm just going to read you a little bit about that. I struck a, I, I, what I did was I created a parallel between an ancient tycoon from the 19th century in San Francisco and a modern tycoon, Charlie Keating. And I showed how their lives in some ways were very, very similar, um, in other ways disparate, but in fact how both of them go on affecting us to this day. Historian Bernard DeVoto once succinctly uh, defined the Western attitude to, to the federal government as, quote, get out and give us more money. Um, despite, its loud, um, despite his loud patriotism, Charlie Keating had scant regard for the US government when it got in his way. After one of the victories, over the regulators hounding him, Keating leaped upon a desk with a foaming magnum of champagne and ripped open his shirt to reveal a t-shirt inscribed, Death to the Feds. Um, it's a sentiment shared by many in the, of his Sunbelt colleagues along with America's private militia. I'm going to take off my glasses here. Um, and then what I do is I go on and I show I talk about several of the 19th century um, bandits and come back to, uh, to Keating. A similar amnesia prevails in, in Arizona today, extending far beyond the federally insured deposits that built fortunes on the credit of the US Treasury. The lakes, fountains, and Killarney green lawns essential for Keating's luxury developments were largely provided by the feds, along with the cheap energy that makes life in the desert bearable. Phoenix itself, with its astonishing boomtown sprawl, would have been impossible without the Bureau of Reclamation created in 1902 by Representative Francis Griffith Newlands of Nevada, about whom you're about to hear a great deal more, snaking over the mountains from the Colorado River, the granite reef aqueduct of the $3 billion Central Arizona Project may, as water historian Mark Reisner has written, come as close to socialism as anything this country has ever done. But for the moment, it keeps the desert cities growing without end. That was Estrella, one of the developments that Keating built with our money. And so it goes on and, and to conclude, we must forget the mistakes of the past in order to repeat them again. The Keatings and Ralstons recur like avatars in every generation because we want them to. We need those men to give us hope. They are what the myth of the self-made man is all about. That the myth is often as much a fraud as they were is fundamental to its eternal return. And so today I'll show you a little bit about what I mean about that. Because in all the, the biographical material on the founder of the Bureau of Reclamation, Francis Griffith Newlands, nobody has gotten to the heart of it and to much of what was behind the creation of an agency which today shapes our lives and shapes the Western United States to an extraordinary degree. Well, we have to start out with land fraud itself. And of course, um, in the 19th century, there was an enormous amount of that, of getting the land out of the public domain and into the private domain. And there was an extraordinary amount of really ingenious charlatanism that did that. Um, the most famous of that are the railroad frauds. Uh, the railroad never would have been built, in fact, without tremendous, um, uh, well, uh, felonies, really. Uh, the, the big four, for example, Stanford, Huntington, Crocker, and Hopkins, um, leveraged about $100,000 of their own capital into some of the largest fortunes of the country by strategically 
uh, using them as bribes in Washington and Sacramento, and then getting enormous amounts of federal land, and also state land as well, too, um, which is today, the remnants of that are in a company called Catellus, which is a spin-off of the land division of the railroad. That is fairly well known, I think, I'd hope. Uh, but the other land frauds are not as well known. Now, this is a cartoon from the Wasp, and I'm going to show you a number of cartoons. This was a 19th century satirical magazine out of San Francisco under the editorship of Ambrose Bierce. And it shows the immigrants coming from Europe, the desirable immigrants, I should say, uh, brought in by railroad advertising in Europe. They're coming to California because they've been promised rich agricultural bottomland, wonderful small farms, just like in the Midwest, except when they come to the West, it's quite different. What they find is large-scale land monopoly, and over it all, the octopus of the railroad, which has been there first and got the richest of the lands. But then around it are all sorts of other enormous land holdings, some of which are still with us. The Newhall Land Company, the Tejon Ranch Company, the Irvine Land Company, the Kern County Land Company. These are still, to some extent, with us today, although most people are unaware of them. Now, once you had acquired this land by whatever means necessary, and I really mean that, by whatever means necessary, um, then what you had to do was to get a good lawyer to codify that into land titles, such as Hall McAllister here outside of San Francisco City Hall, one of the biggest of the land attorneys at that time. These lawyers often ended up with a great deal of that land, too, as payment in fees, particularly when they were adjudicating the Mexican land grants. They would often end up with all of the land. But when uh, dealing with others, they got enormous fees, some of it in land, often in money as well, too. And that then would transfer the land into its real reality, which is paper real estate, and you would get it in the, the title office, and this basically throws it onto the market for trading on the market. We take that for granted. We don't think very much about it. Native Americans would have thought that was very odd, if not obscene, in fact. Here you have an advertisement for the turn of the century showing Indians trading land, and Carnegie says, of course, it's the best thing to do. Um, if, you've got, um, if you've made your money in something really risky, like mining or silicon chips or something like that, the best thing you can do is to put it into land. As Mark Twain said, they're not making it anymore. And uh, let's see, I don't have the book here. I have a quote actually in my book from the young William Randolph Hearst, which is in one of his letters to his pop over in the Bancroft Library. He advises his dad in 1885 to get out of mining and put it into real estate. Every atom added to the struggling mass of humanity means another figure to the landlord's bank account, he tells his father, Senator George Hearst. And George doesn't need any encouragement. He's already doing it. He's getting hundreds of thousands of acres throughout the West and millions of acres in Mexico, thanks to their good friend Porfirio Diaz, the dictator of Mexico. And to a large extent, the Hearst fortune is based as much, or maybe even more so, on land than it is on mining and journalism. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is what I've been studying for quite some time, and that is the fortunes that came out of the Comstock load over in Virginia City. Um, this is Virginia City, and underneath Virginia City was the deepest, richest, and hottest deposit of precious metals probably ever discovered. In a space of about 25 years, $400 million in gold and silver was taken out of this deposit. And that is largely what built San Francisco, but it had a much larger impact than that. It was at least a national, and I would say an international impact, which has never been fully studied until I came along. Um, and you're going to hear a little bit about that today. The Comstock Lode is a deep fissure vein in a geothermal region, and it is not uniform. Um, in it are bonanza bodies of rich ore which at that time were profitable to mine. The rest of it wasn't at that time. Now it would be. Um, but what this created was a speculative market unlike any other. I mean, really a, a frenzied market um, to which I didn't think we would ever see anything quite like it again until the 1990s came along. And then we saw something precisely like it, in fact. So what, what the mines were looking for, or the owners of the mines, were these bodies of rich ore that were embedded in the Comstock load like plums in a pudding, randomly displayed. 
uh, uh, set out in the thing. And what they're looking for are these bodies. Now, the Comstock couldn't have happened, <clears throat> nor these bodies ex been exploited, without the creation of a mining exchange in San Francisco to raise pooled capital with which to exploit those bodies of ore. And that was established in 1862 in response to the discovery of the Comstock three years later. Um, this also would not have been possible if the year before, San Francisco had not been connected with New York and with Virginia City by a telegraph line, which connects it, begins to connect it with the world. So in a very short period of time, the San Francisco Mining and Stock Exchange, the San Francisco Stock and Exchange Board, excuse me, just known as the Mining Exchange, or the change, um, becomes the greatest mining stock exchange in the world, really putting San Francisco on the map because of its symbiotic relationship with the Comstock load. The point I'm trying to make is that far more money was made by manipulating inside information than was ever made by gold and silver itself. In fact, most of the mines in the Comstock were money losers. What was really um, the way that you concentrated capital was by pulling people into the speculative bubble and manipulating information and then basically getting their savings. This is a cartoon from the WASP and it shows the familiar names whose names are on downtown San Francisco buildings or at least were uh, in the past and then the tens of thousands of people who were ruined and wandered the streets on California and Liedestorf Street and who are now forgotten to history what we remember are the winners, but we don't remember how they won and what their impact is on us today. Let's see. Okay. There's the mining exchange. This is California Street going up Knob Hill. There's the mining exchange on California Street, and it was intimately connected with the Bank of California. Here was the principal bank of the West, with an astonishing $5 million capitalization at that time, one of the largest banks in the country. Um, and it's connected with the mining exchange because the board members of the, of the Bank of California are the board members of the mining exchange at that time. And so you can see they're trading information. They become among the richest men on the West Coast. Uh, here's a portrait of them. All of these men were millionaires. This is like a small solar system revolving around this man. Uh, William Chapman Ralston, the cashier of the Bank of California and its mastermind. This is the titular head of it, Darius Ogden Mills. And then these men essentially will be involved with them in a number of ventures. But these two, and one other one, William Sharon, about whom you're about to hear, are the triumvirate that essentially run this whole deal. What the depositors didn't know is that their deposits were being invested in the mines and mills and railroads and lumberlands of the Comstock to enrich these men. And for a while, that worked. Uh, for about 11 years, it paid off like a busted slot machine. So San Francisco's fate was intimately tied with that of Virginia City just east of Lake Tahoe. They were intimately connected. Now, the profits from manipulating this information, as well as from the mines and the mills and everything else, were so great that Ralston undertook with various partners a number of speculative ventures in San Francisco and elsewhere. He saw himself as being the Lorenzo de' Medici of San Francisco. And so he created factories and various other things. But his largest project was the Palace Hotel the world's largest hotel when it was completed in 1875. Market Street is right along there. There's Knob Hill. Market Street's there. And here you have this 800-room um, hotel, which would be the greatest hotel in the world when San Francisco's 25 years old. This is New Montgomery Street going down here. And what the Palace Hotel is meant to do is to raise the value of the real estate which, Sharon, uh, which uh, Ralston and his partners have bought along there to extend the high values of north of market, south of market, to land which they own. This is the palace, the original palace. And they also owned a hotel on the other corner called the Grand Hotel, which was connected by a sky bridge to the palace because the Grand Hotel is where the mistresses would live. And then they could cross over here to the residential suites of the Bonanza Kings in the top floors of the Palace Hotel. 
among those Senator Sharon himself. But essentially, the reason that the Palace Hotel's main entrance is not on Market Street, but on New Montgomery to this day, is because Ralston, and later Sharon, owned all of the real estate on New Montgomery Street. So this is a real estate venture. Um, they also, of course, controlled the forests of the central Sierra, particularly that around Lake Tahoe. This is Truckee, um, after the railroad has gotten to it, to get the the lumber out as fuel and timber for the mines of Virginia City. And in fact, actually, the environmental consequences of that are going on today, although they're somewhat subtle to this day. Um, but I talk about that in the book, in fact, what the environmental consequences of those mines were. Ralston, uh, well, there, there are four biographies of Ralston, and he was a great operator, a kind of Shakespearean character, um, who really was constantly um, pushing the envelope um, with legality and also with his investments. He was investing in all sorts of things, and several times he came very close to ruin. One of those was in 1873, when in fact he invested big in a mine which turned out not to have payable ore in it, and another uh, uh, quartet uh, got the real big bonanza, which was in the center of the Comstock. When that happened, and they established the Bank of Nevada, Ralston was in deep trouble. So he really goes out on a limb. He acquires the city's water company, the Spring Valley Water Company, which had a monopoly on San Francisco's water. And this is the system. Oops, let me go back. This is the system. Uh, with the aqueducts going down to the lands on the peninsula and then across to the lands in Alameda and Santa Clara counties, which the city of San Francisco still owns, bringing the water into San Francisco. It was with this, of course, that Ralston and everybody connected with him knew that sand is virtually worthless unless you can bring water to it. And this was a lesson, of course, that was well known at that time. It's, it's a point that I want to constantly reiterate. These people knew that the greatest cash crop that you can grow is not alfalfa or apricots, it's a city. But that bringing water to this land, in fact, is very, very capital intensive. And it would be better if you could get somebody else to carry the burden of that. Well, in August of 1875, Ralston's good friend, partner, and protege, William Sharon, who had just bought himself a senatorial seat from Nevada. He was the boss of the Comstock dealing for the bank up there. What he did in August 25th, 1875, was suddenly dump his stocks on the mining exchange, precipitating a run, first on the exchange and then on the Bank of California, which was conveniently just across the street. The mob rushed across to the bank, besieged it for their deposits, Remember, there was no FDIC at that time. And at 2.35 in the afternoon, the bank closed its doors. It was out of money. This was a national shock, an international shock at that time. What it turned out was, of course, that Ralston had uh, no clear line between his finances and that of the bank. And in fact, the bank was $5 million in debt uh, because of Ralston's um, embezzlements. We'd call it embezzlements today. Then something quite extraordinary happened. The board of directors of the Bank of California ordered an accounting the same day. They ordered Ralston to turn over his entire estate to his good friend and protege, Sharon, which he did, because it was considered to be all liabilities and no assets. And Ralston went out on his swim, his daily swim in the bay, and he didn't come back alive. Um, to this day, people debate whether it was suicide or, an over, or stress. It's not clear. It is reported that Sharon went down to the morgue that evening and was overheard to say best thing he could have done. Well, certainly it was for the Sharon family, in fact, because very soon, uh, within about a year, Sharon was one of the wealthiest men on the West Coast, just after Darius Ogden Mills. He owned everything that Ralston had owned, his estate at Belmont, his townhouse, the Palace Hotel, the factories, and all of the real estate and the ranches and everything else. Here's a banquet honoring Senator Sharon, um, oops, who is right over there smoking a cigar. Um, 
He was a t totally unlikable character, but you had to give deference to somebody who was that rich. Well, everything looked great for Senator Sharon for just a few years until it turned out that an attractive young lady named Sir Althea Hill showed up claiming to be his wife um, by a handwritten marriage contract. This precipitated what was the O.J. Simpson trial of the late 19th century. Um, it was an astonishing series of revelations about what people really do behind closed doors. Um, Sharon didn't deny he had had an affair with the young lady, but absolutely denied that he was her husband. He, I think he was much too canny to get into anything like that, but it provided the gossip columnist and the wasp with a great deal of fodder as this incredibly complex and salacious trial wended its way through the courts. Um, here you have Sarah squaring off with the elderly senator. The judges all around, the lawyers, of course, make creamy, enormous amounts of money off um, the nightmare. Um, it went on after the senator's death in 1885. Sarah would not give up. Um, it's just too complex and, and, and obscene to really detail this. The important point is that Sharon's family had a vested interest in making sure that this charge didn't stick because if it did, the estate would be cut in half at the very least. And in fact, they didn't want that to happen. So judges were appropriately um, uh, bribed um, and various other, the, the, the lead judge, for example, was always given a room in the Palace Hotel when he came to San Francisco. They were the best of friends, et cetera. And finally, the thing was um, uh, decided in the Sharon Estate's favor. Uh, Sarah's husband, who was then her attorney, was shot um, and killed, and she went insane and spent the last years of her life in the Stockton Insane Asylum, and the Sharon family becomes extraordinarily wealthy. What did they do with that money? Well, a number of things, and here we have to go to genealogy. In 1881, the senators, one of the senators' two lovely daughters marries Sir Fairmore Hesketh, an elderly British nobleman who is in San Francisco Bay um, looking for a wife, and he discovers uh, this lovely young lady who's a uh, father, he finds out, owns the palace that he's staying at, um, the hotel. And so he proposes marriage. And that produces one of these sort of um, Henry James alliances of American money and European title. That brings Easton Neston, a Christopher Wren-designed estate, into the Sharon family as well as a titled son-in-law. And to this day, the Fairmore Hescus are, in fact, um, by uh, by Continental. They come over here quite a bit. They're on the boards of various ranches and mining companies, and the profits from that continue to nourish their properties back in England. Um, uh, William Sharon's son, Fred, marries the daughter of this man, Lloyd Tevis, one of the great operators of the West. His partner and brother-in-law was James Benally Hagen, and their partner was George Hurst, and Tevis and Hagen created the Kern County Land Company and much else besides. At one point, Lloyd Tevis was head president of Wells Fargo and vice president of Southern Pacific Railroad, as well as numerous other companies. These were really big corporate raiders of their time. And so the Sharon and the Tevis families come close together. In 1877, James Benelli Hagen in Washington, through strategically placed bribes, gets Congress to pass the Desert Lands Act and immediately they begin filing for hundreds of thousands of acres in the San Joaquin Valley through their agent, Billy Carr, who's grabbing up these marsh and river lands, claiming that they are in fact um, desert lands using dummies employed by Wells Fargo and Southern Pacific employees. And these become then the core of the Kern County Land Company, which is, here's a Carlton Watkins photograph of the some of the hundreds of thousands of acres that are the Kern County Land Company. Really good land, all it needs is water. Now the third daughter, Clara, in 1874, marries her father's chief attorney, a brilliant attorney named Francis Griffith Newlands, who had come out from Maryland. Uh, this is the young Francis Griffith Newlands, and he really was brilliant. I've read enough of his letters, can't deny him that. Also extremely ambitious at the same time. Um, Francis Griffith Newlands, by being his father-in-law's chief attorney, knows everything about the Sharon Estate Company. And in fact, after Sharon's death, will become the lead trustee 
of the Sharon Estate Company as his brother Fred becomes a cocaine addict in Paris. Um, in 1887, he decides that he will run for the US Senate in California, but it's bought out from underneath him by George Hearst. And here's a cartoon of sour grapes, uh, the young uh, Francis Griffith Newland slinking off. He writes a letter saying, I've come to hate this place, i.e. San Francisco. I think I'll go down to our lands in Arizona and look after that, Arizona Territory. But he decides, eventually changes his mind, and he decides to set his sights on Nevada, the great rotten borough of the United States, because there are so few people in Nevada that it's really cheap to buy yourself a seat in the Senate or the Congress at that time, and it is just notoriously corrupt and has been ever since the Comstock load, in fact. So he'll do that. His father-in-law had done it, after all. It's a good plan. His law partner in San Francisco, he had great law partners. One of them was William Stewart, a senator from Nevada, and another was William Herron, the political boss of the Southern Pacific and Central Pacific Railroad. And so this brings the Sharon and the railroad company close together. Clara dies in childbirth, and so he's a widower for a few years, and then he marries uh, the daughter of um, Hall McAllister, um, who is the leading attorney of the West and the brother of Ward McAllister, the social arbiter of Manhattan, the man who coined the term the 400. So he's now in national or international society. Um, he marries well. And so he runs for Congress um, with strategic bribes in, in Nevada. Um, this was a cartoon, 1902, just after the Reclamation Act was passed in the Reno Evening Gazette, I think it was. Um, Newlands is saying, show me something money will not buy and I will lose faith in the Sharon Estate. This is just after the Reclamation Act had passed. The Sharon Estate was the largest landholder in Nevada other than the railroad with which it was intimately connected through these law and financial partnerships. And they all need water. Well, in going through Newland's papers, both here and in Yale, what I discovered was that what he did initial, immediately was go into the real estate business. He's involved in everything. He is a micromanager of the, of the first order. And on House of Representatives and then Senate stationery, he is conducting business about the Sharon Estate properties, which are all over the place. And these letters are 20, 30 pages long, in fact. He keeps track of everything. One of the first properties that he decides to develop is a little place down the San Francisco Peninsula, south of the border of, of San Francisco, land that they had acquired from the Ralston Estate called Burlingame Park. And he builds the first country club in the West at Burlingame Park, which will become Hillsboro. And it's a model planned community on the order of Frederick Law Olmsted's um, sort of suburban ideals. Um, it raises the value of property down the peninsula, um, kind of advertisement. Essentially, it is, this is one of those sort of early gated communities. It essentially is getting the sons and, well, the, the children and the grandchildren of those who had made the enormous fortunes in the 19th century out of the city, into the fresh air, and into a white community, because these communities have racial covenants. And so here you have a millionaire's community organized around a country club and polo grounds down the peninsula. So um, advertisements for getting out. It's horse country down there. And their friends and business associates build rather large houses on the order of Newport, Rhode Island. This is one of the Crocker uh, places down there, um, the uplands. Meanwhile, Newlands, of course, is in Washington, D.C., making strategic uh, contacts. Uh, he becomes one of the most powerful congressmen in Washington and then one of the most powerful senators, partly because of his immense intellect, but also because he's cutting people in on real estate deals. And the most valuable real estate deal is Chevy Chase. Um, the Nevada syndicate of Sharon and Stewart had bought farms around a little place called DuPont Circle. 
uh, right there on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. And then Newlands buys up all the land along something called, which will be called Connecticut Avenue, going out to the border of Washington, where he buys about 1,600 acres, which he's going to subdivide and call Chevy Chase. Um, another one of these restricted, sort of walled community for the best people, safely outside of Washington, D.C. This is a map that shows all the farms that they quietly, through dummies, bought up all along Connecticut Avenue, which is today the best part of Washington to live in, going out to Chevy Chase. Uh, this is the ideal community of Chevy Chase. I think part of this was designed by the Olmsteads, in fact. Um, and what he's doing with Chevy Chase and the lands along Connecticut Avenue is cutting in people like President Cleveland and strategic senators and representatives in on the deal. So that's why Rock Creek Park and the National Zoo and the observatory are out along that thing as favors to Senator Newlands, uh, in fact, to raise the value of the properties which everybody else was profiting on at the same time. Now, the Spanish-American and Philippine-American War were seen as godsends for, uh, by Francis Griffith Newlands, according to his letters, because real estate prices had been in the tank through the early 1890s. And when the United States acquired a Pacific empire in 1898, and he was one of the leading exponents of the annexation of Hawaii at this time, in fact, in his letters he said, this will just be a, a bonanza for our real estate holdings in San Francisco as well as, of course, the geopolitics of having an empire in the Pacific into which we can go. So he's very much in favor of, and I talk about this a great deal in my book, the imperial future of California because it will benefit the Sharon Estate uh, Company very, very much. Uh, just after the 1906 fire and earthquake, in fact, he and his nephew, James Newlands, um, threatened to use eminent domain to acquire um, what becomes Muir Woods on Mount Tamalpais. It hadn't been logged yet. There were still virgin redwoods, and he threatens uh, to acquire this by eminent domain to log the redwoods and flood it as a water supply for San Francisco. And Representative William Kent, the lord of Marin County, in fact, and a, a real good guy on the whole, a progressive, in fact, manages through extraordinary clever uh, ledger domain to safeguard it and give it to the nation as a national monument, stalemating the Newlands in their efforts to destroy it. Well, finally, to irrigation and reclamation. Um, this is a plan by, uh, by w William Chapman Ralston and various other capitalists in the 1870s to create a series of um, canals draining Tulare Lake in the San Joaquin Valley. Here's Tulare Lake, and they were, they were going to do is to create a series of canals linking it with the delta. And then there would be branch canals, essentially a great um, irrigation and navigation scheme, which would make them enormously wealthy if this could be done. The problem was getting the right, right of ways for these and also um, the enormous amount of labor and capital that would require, which was far too great for them. The thing collapsed. It didn't happen. There were tremendous lawsuits and all. And this is something, of course, that Newlands would have been very, very aware of. He became involved in um, abortive irrigation schemes also in Arizona and Nevada, and he found it just doesn't work using private capital. It requires too much. So. All through the 1890s, um, largely because of the impetus of John Wesley Powell, there is increasing, and the Grange, there's increasing movement to have a national reclamation service, some sort of government assistance to create these great water projects. And the story is rather long and complex, but eventually in June, on June 17th of 1902, the National Reclamation Act is passed largely at the behest of Congressman Newlands, who at that time is also becoming a senator. Um, and it's known popularly as the Newlands Act. Uh, he's up there, his, his head is just, he's been decapitated by that black thing up there, but he's up there. Um, and of course, he's very, very proud of this. He writes a letter almost immediately to his sister-in-law's barrister in Manchester, telling him that in fact, uh, it had been passed. He was elected to the Senate. 
And then he goes on for page after page to talk about how the state will benefit from this government investment. This is a monument to Francis Griffith Newlands, builder of the nation in Reno, Nevada, which is appropriate. Um, and it talks about you know, bringing water to the arid lands and about how it will flourish and blossom as the rose. Uh, the reclamation engineers immediately went to work and started building projects all over the place. This is down in the Imperial Valley with the U.S. Reclamation Service initials on it, one of the headworks. This would very soon be dwarfed by much larger projects, of course. This was the ideal, of course, the small owner-occupied farm. The Reclamation Act never would have made it through Congress had it not had the populist provision of the 160-acre limitation about which um, um, Paul hmm? Taylor. Taylor, right, I, mean, I just went blank. Paul Taylor uh, wrote so eloquently about, yes, you know, the water was only to be provided to farms of 160 acres occupied by the farmers themselves. And so it looked pretty good. And so you would have these you know, uh, Jeffersonian farms sprouting up in the arid lands of the West. Well, in fact, it was almost immediately abrogated, as you will see as I'm sure you, many of you know. Here's Newlands himself, Representative Senator Newlands, along the Truckee River in Reno, the father of the Bureau of Reclam Reclamation. Um, this is a map of Reno showing where Newlands built his house. It's a rather large house south of the Truckee, and there's nice improvements, sort of Italian Renaissance bridges along the Truckee. That's because Newlands owned downtown Reno, in fact, and so, he had plans to make it the Paris of the Great Basin, um, to beautify it, to increase the value of his property. It's unfortunate that this map stops here because just after the Reclamation Act was passed, he acquired through the Desert Lands Act 15,000 acres north of Reno, in fact, which I believe the family is developing to this day, in fact. But what it needed was water. He also acquired the water rights to Donner Lake, which the government would need for the Newlands Project, which was the first reclamation project which would divert the Truckee River into the Carson River Basin, in fact, in the land which he had acquired for reservoir sites. You all know the movie Chinatown. It's the greatest educational movie ever made about water politics. Um, it's not altogether factually correct, but who cares? Um, it really teaches you how things actually work uh, in the real world. Uh, you all, I'm sure you remember Jack Nicholson sort of tearing off the page in the land office, in fact, just before he gets his nose slit. Um, I sometimes feel that way when I'm in the Bancroft Library, uh, delving through all of this stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Here we have the three men um, who took the water out of the Owens River, o Owens River, Owens Valley, and brought it into the San Fernando Valley. This engineer is J.B. Lippincott, um, one of the first major engineers for the Reclamation Service, and he was the one who used the Reclamation Service to take the land um, out of the public domain and make sure that the speculators in Los Angeles got it and diverted the water into the San Fernando Valley, of course. Um, well, as Mark Reisner commented in Cadillac Desert, the one of the first acts of the Bureau of Reclamation was to take water away from small farmers and give it to a potential city. That might seem kind of odd, except that Teddy Roosevelt, who had backed the National Reclamation Act because of small farmers, ostensibly, was all in favor of it. He said, um, he applauded Lippincott, he said, it is a hundred or a thousand fold more important to the state and more valuable to the people as a whole if this water is used by the city than if it is used by the people of the Owens Valley. So he was actually in favor of using this stuff to create a city rather than to create small farms. And that, here's Roosevelt in 1903 coming to San Francisco and then visiting Los Angeles where I believe he made that comment. In fact, he also, of course, was in favor of Hetch Hetchy um, in, the na in a national park to create the greater San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, unbeknownst to most people, the Sharon Estate owned lands in Pasadena and Santa Ana and they needed water for that land. They also owned land, um, thousands of acres near Madeira, uh, the Berenda properties, um, which would also need water, and they would get that eventually too, I think after they'd sold out. 
Well, the, one of the, uh, I think it was the second project was the Salt River project, which dammed the Gila and Salt River uh, near a nascent city called Phoenix. And they owned thousands of acres near there as well, too, which they had acquired through the Desert Land Act. And so here's Roosevelt Dam going up, and those symbols of the past, the Indians watching as their land is flooded. But that, of course, was a piker compared with what was to come, Hoover Dam. Um, and Hoover Dam, of course, was what made Las Vegas and Los Angeles as we know it today, and Arizona and Phoenix and everything else possible. This is a creation of the Bureau of Reclamation. This is not, of course, what those who backed the Reclamation Act in 1902 had in mind. But this is what it has become with the major streets going along the section lines, carving it out into what had been farms, but is now this electrified grid of the Los Angeles, Southern California basin. Couldn't have been possible without what I just told you. These are lands down in the Imperial Valley. This is the kind of land that the water was supposed to go to. This is what it produces today, in fact. Um, Las Vegas. How did it happen? Why haven't more people asked about this? It's one of the greatest perversions of the national law that I know about, and yet it simply goes on without question. But I hope that I've answered, in fact, that question um, by showing you, in fact, what was going on behind the scenes, which today, I think before today, most people were fairly unaware of. Thank you very much. Mm. 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 Well, I guess I've ended on time. And we do have some time for some questions. Yes. I don't know whether that's possible. It seems highly likely. <laughs> Do you know that that is true? It wouldn't at all surprise me, in fact. Um, from what I hear, in fact, Catellus never had the um, legal right to develop uh, Mission Bay, in fact, because that land was, was deeded to them as a, um, as a right of way to revert to the public. In fact, if it was never, if it was not used for uh, public transportation, Mission Bay, yes, uh, Mission Bay in San Francisco, but in fact, of course, it became fee fee simple. In fact, but apparently they had no right to really develop that. That was public property, but I'd like to check on that. Um, let's see. There, were, I wanted to read you something actually. Um, Well, I can't find it here, but essentially um, there was actually an attack on Newlands um, by his political opponents in Nevada because they did find out that in fact he was paying something like um, a dollar or less on these desert lands that he had acquired while people, small farmers nearby, were paying 10 times that amount, in fact. And so what he was doing, in fact, was not altogether unknown, at least in Nevada. Uh, outside of Nevada, it was very unknown, it seems. Yes? Right. Um, you talked about what happened in history, and we think that that's been and Oh, no, I don't. Well, I mean, <laughs> what I'm saying is, as we speak today, this, this alliance of, we tend to think of this urban ag antipathy, but actually through the Bureau of Reclamation, there's this great symbiosis between urban land and agricultural land right. going on very much before our eyes. Fresno, for example. Mm -hmm. And the expansion, you know, Fresno is one of the fastest growing urban areas in California, and, you know, <coughs> that, of course, this Bureau of Reclamation water from the San Joaquin River. There's also a symbiosis of, between the Bureau of Reclamation and land. You, you, you talk about land, but now it's, now it's all about water rights. Yes. They, you know, for example, the San Joaquin River exchangers, the Sacramento River exchangers, got the best water rights deal in California, bar none, the cheapest, 
water, the best water, most secure water supply, courtesy of the Bureau of Reclamation. And so this, this, this is all going on before our very eyes right now. And I, I, I keep pointing back to the San Joaquin River because it's something I'm working on. It is dry because of this collusion between urban interests, agricultural interests, and the Bureau of Reclamation. Working all very much together as we speak. Mm -hmm. It's happening right now. So. That's right. And, um, and what it really comes down to is that the land becomes a commodity. And that the agriculture is really only a holding pattern until either the water can be sold and shipped on the water market to some distant place, or it can be turned into a city. And so, in fact, the San Joaquin is being urbanized to a large extent right now. I, I didn't actually stick in what we're about to be um, prevailed upon to finance. And at this point, it's $37 billion for a high-speed bullet train down the San Joaquin Valley that the developers are absolutely salivating at the prospect of, in the way that the developers 100 years ago salivated at the prospect of mainline canals. Uh, that, that bullet train will in fact serve the same purpose and finish off the urbanization of the Central Valley and we will pay for it. I'm not saying it shouldn't be built, but it should be built. If it's going to be built, it should be built with land use controls because we're going to be paying for the infrastructure itself. Yeah, Mike. What do we do if uh, water um, and it is according to law, um, would that create a disruption? Well, I'm sure it would. But given the present political climate, it's hard to think of it as anything other than a commodity. I know you do. I mean, I certainly would like to see it in the public trust. But ever since the Mona Lake case, of course, that's been virtually moot in public discussion, unfortunately. Well, it's all okay. The, um, the Attorney General has been, um, well, the office has been, you know, the Department of Water Resources does this water plan, and um, they've mentioned the public trust, and they've actually acknowledged Mona Lake. Um, they were kicking and screaming about language about uh, water and tributaries to navigable waters. But it's there. And um, I, I think there might be some hope. Uh, it, seems, uh, yeah, it seems like there could be. Well, the problem is you have to get it out in public discussion. And, and that, is, that is a problem I don't know how to surmount, in fact, because the media is not going to pick that up, unfortunately. Well, do you think the university would? I mean, because, uh, this university? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Remember, Elwood Mead got his start here. <laughs> I believe it was his start. Yeah, David. What became of the Newlands fortune, power, and congressional seats? Whatever became of it? Well, Newlands died in 1917. And in fact, the family is still around. Um, the daughters inherited the Palace Hotel, which they sold in 1954 to the Sheraton chain. But they still feel a great affection for it. In fact, the family does. Um, members of the family, in fact, are, um, represent Monterey County. Sam and Fred Farr are members of that family, in fact. And pretty good environmentalists, I, I'll add, at the same time. So the family is still around. It's rather quiet. You don't hear about it very much. But um, in fact, they're into land development. Um, it's still going on. And I believe that a lot of that land is land that Newlands acquired back at that time, in fact. They're not in Congress. Well, no, the far, uh, is it Sam or Fred Farr who is now in office? Sam, Sam is in, in office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. These days of the television, you see public prosecutors coming and saying, nobody is above the law. Mm -hmm. And everything here is below the law. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's just goes on. I mean, it's pretty much the same. They'll trot out a Martha Stewart every once in a while. Uh, Jeff Skilling or something, but you know, I mean, this is really pretty much still going on completely. Um, I'm sure all of you have stories of your own about what's going on. I really got into this actually when um, it was in the 1980s. I was working at KQED and we did the story on the poison in the Kesterson Wildlife Refuge, and I had been as innocent as an egg before then. You go into the San Joaquin Valley and start doing water politics, and in fact, it is, uh, it is a dark star out there, and it bends gravity. Uh, it's really weird. Um, and of course, 
what we were encountering was the immense gravitational field of the Westlands Water District, which bends everything and distorts light around it, in fact. Um, and it's very much sort of the contemporary equivalent of what I've just been talking about. I'm delighted to see that the, that the King of California is out and that it's really, people are reading it, in fact. I mean, that is an inside story on the J.G. Boswell Company and how that fortune, in fact, has distorted uh, the gravitational field around it, too. And it's amazing that they got the interviews they did with Boswell because, as he famously said, the whale that doesn't surface doesn't get harpooned. And so um, he made the mistake of sticking his head up. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what's your view on the quantification settlement agreements, the Colorado River quantification settlement agreement? That just got signed last year with lots of uh, arm twisting. Yeah, I haven't really kept up with that, so I can't, I can't comment on it, I'm sure. Peter? <laughs> yeah, another great example that quantification settlement of how this urban agricultural alliance through the Bureau of Reclamation. It's, it's, it's the agricultural water supply that used to go to the Bureau of Irrigation District that we saw here, now will be transferred to urban Southern California. This is, you know, given the reliability that it's desperately you know, seeking. So that's what that QSA is all about. It, it, an incredible amount of federal and state energy is put into it and arm twisting like you've never seen to make it happen. But it's again, I mean, I, I really, you know, what that Dre is pointing out, it's, we tend to think of the Bureau of Reclamation and the CDP and agricultural land, and what I think Dre is making a point here is the urban land and the urbanization of the West is what's really benefited in the agricultural land is this, as you say, holding spot. But the QSA is a perfect example. One of the great stories of the West that, again, has not been told is the um, the saga of these enormous dynastic land holdings like Irvine, Newhall, uh, Tejon, which was the Chandler, and uh, Sherman families, um, Kern County, Miller and Lux, etc. cetera. Um, either remnants or large chunks of these are still around with us, and they have played a tremendous behind the scenes role in, in water and transportation politics in this uh, in the latter part of this century, particularly by getting Highway 5 and the California State Water Project built down the San Joaquin and into Southern California that gave enormous added value to the Newhall lands around Valencia, which are all now being urbanized. Um, they own, I think it's eight other large ranches around California, all of which they plan to develop. Um, and so they're doing this on the, on the public purse. Uh, Tejon Ranch will be developed because the California Aqueduct goes right through their property, as does, I believe it's Highway 5 goes through it as well, too. And so, in fact, uh, this kind of thing goes on to this day, but it's almost entirely unknown. It's, it's never reported on. Mm -hmm. Where do you see uh, tribal water rights fitting into this picture you described? You have the Westland Sucupo, the Trinity Water, you have the uh, Albuquerque versus the Pueblo of the tribal the What's your forecast? You know, I haven't really been following that, and that's a, that's a really interesting point. Um, what I'm most aware of is what's happening to Pyramid Lake, you know, I mean, because the Truckee River just simply is not large enough by any measure to support what Reno is becoming now. Uh, it's astonishing to see that growth out there, and of course the impact is very, very obvious on, the, on Pyramid Lake and the Paiute Indian Reservation, but they've, they've gotten some of their water, haven't they? They've gotten some of it back, I think, Actually, because. Aaron Cascade over in the city has been very pivotal. That's right, yeah. Yeah, his wife actually wants to go so far as to bring back Winnemucca Marsh next to it. I hope to see that someday. But I don't know. I haven't followed that. It's something to keep your eye on because the Clean Water Act is, is one of the five pieces of legislation that tries to actually gain privacy. Mm -hmm. It's 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 looming. Okay, I'll try to follow that. Well, on that note, okay. many thanks. All right. Great. Thanks very much.